Hello, MCR watchers. Hello, internet. I have a very special guest today on NGP Speaks. This is a very, very close friend, a talented interdisciplinary artist. His name is Current. And uh, yeah, we're going to get really deep into it. We're going to talk about quite a few things. Traveling, crypto, AV, maybe NFTs, DAOs, music, a lot of music, maybe art, art history a little bit. For sure. So, conceptual art. Conceptual art. There we go. Matmos, right? Yes. Yeah. 20th century conceptual art. 21st century conceptual art. Yep. Is that better? Yeah, it's better. Cool. Um, yeah, 21st century conceptual art. That'd be cool to discuss that. So yeah, without further ado, current. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Yeah. So how did you end up in uh, in Miami? Did you just like come out of a void or how? Actually, I've been coming to Miami for a few years, but um, more intensely, as you know, in the last year or so. And basically, if I'm in the neighborhood, which is North America, I always try to um, stop by here because I really um, appreciate the the attitude of people here. Mm -hmm. So I was, quote unquote, in the neighborhood um, doing something not too far um, on this continent. And I um, thought, well, okay, I need to stop by, um, see how things are going here. and. Um, Go to the synth battle, which is one of my favorite. Um, what is synth battle for those that that may not know? Okay, cool, perfect question. So I don't know if this exists anywhere else. I've only encountered it here. Um, it's basically this event where anyone who's working on their own productions or live sets can go and perform, test what they're working on, and. Um, it's what people here call open plug event. So anyone um, interested can sign up. Happens every Tuesday. Um, and you have slots of like 15 minutes and there's like a longer slot um, that is, I guess if somebody's more prepared or something like that. Um, I guess it's probably not super dogmatic about time. If you go a little bit under or over, it's not the end of the world. So yeah, it just gives people an opportunity to um, test out what they were working at, but also like build this community element, which I think is like super important. And you also get to meet all these people that, that are doing something similar to you. And um, I kind of, I, I imagine that everything interesting starts in some kind of a small, intimate way. And um, I think this is one of these gems of context where you can go and do your thing and um, feel like you're uh, you're not alone <laughs> doing what you do as a musician. So you are a digital nomad and I'm sure that you've seen other major cities kind of like uh, replicate or emulate this small intimate creative incubation space but yeah throughout your travels have you seen other cities that um, mirror what we're experiencing here with synth battle and other initiatives of course but uh yeah um yes and no so um in i guess there's like what i've seen in 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 person and um what i've read about uh, i'll start with the stuff that i read about um because i think it's relevant i was um reading this interview with uh, Robert Henke, who's one of the co-founders of Ableton. And um, he was saying that back in the 90s, um, there was this bar um, that had a, a sign at the top um, saying Panasonic, which is just like the, the company. Um, and this is where um, my favorite um, act got their name, Panasonic, because it, they just like picked the... Um, you know the name from the sign but there's some kind of bar in in berlin where people would just gather and kind of um play their stuff there and the people that would gather was like him and uh 
Nick Cavagno and the other guy from Panasonic and uh, I heard Richie Houghton was there and there's just basically early on Aphex Twin um, so these people just kind of like hang out there and do their thing and now you know all of them are like these huge names but at the time it's kind of like nobody cared that much about what they're up to right um so i think there's like some resemblance uh with that kind of thing where you could say that you know <laughs> except for the people who are there to listen at the sin battle like and some people having a beer or something like the the rest of people in miami maybe don't care that this is happening uh so you kind of have to be in the know which i think is how some of the best things like shape up like you basically it's not exclusive because it costs too much money to get in or there's some other kind of barrier to entry it's just, the barrier to entry is that you know that it's happening uh and then you care to be there um so and in terms of like what i've seen um there's definitely i've seen in a few places jams where like a modular jam or some other kind of like hardware jam where you um where people will turn up and and they have their gear already plugged in or they plug it in in the process and sort of play together but i think that's different because um because then you're like forced to to play with other people um whereas the um, the sin battle gives you kind of an opportunity as an individual to um to test your material um and yes see how you feel about performing it but also see how other people respond to it um so yeah i i don't think there's any i haven't seen anything exactly like it and um i wish every city had that um i think it's one of the things that's like worth replicating actually a friend of mine was doing something similar with productions um it was called the producer social this is in la and also in other parts of the u.s where as a producer you would um if you're working on a track or something you'd go play it and then um uh get feedback on it so people would like say what they think about your arrangement or your <laughs> mixing or whatever mastering whatever it is so it's a bit more like an informal school um and i also know some some friends um who also would organize events to essentially test their like live sets or new music um, that are private. I guess what makes the the sin battle unique and so appealing to me is that a it's open to anyone. B it's kind of self curated, <laughs> meaning anyone can participate, um, and um, and it's focused on material that's kind of more raw or not like not finished or or like there to be tested it, it's not like the final product basically yeah and what's so great about like being in community where prototypes are being shared or there's like iteration or there's feedback on the spot is like you don't need to go to an academy you don't need to go to an institution you don't need to dm someone it's there and it's in real time right so there's so many benefits that don't require indoctrination or don't require some form of like risk taking um, outside of just the performance itself. So, yeah, I mean, having those spaces is really important. Those safe spaces to be able to share music and to practice uh, performing live is amazing for acts that are trying to get into the music industry in that in that way. Um, so it's cool. It's cool the, that you've you've experienced that. In, in yeah, other there's actually something degree. similar. I just remembered. Um, so I. Um, studied and practiced um, performance, video installation, public intervention uh, in San Francisco. This is where I went to school. And um, there was actually, it, I went to San Francisco Art Institute, which is unfortunately now going out of uh, business. Um, but it's this like iconic school, which also happens to be a private art school. And I, and I had a, a full ride, so I didn't pay for it. But it was very expensive then, it's very expensive now. But there was this um, instructor there and an artist whose name is John Rubin, who basically um, started a school low key on the side <laughs> of, of the school. Um, and he also started this like kind of like a informal art fair called Black Market. Um, where it was, I guess, kind of like Art Basel or something, but like uh, all like uh, kind of DIY. 
And, um, and so, yeah, there was this sort of tension between, you know, people paying a ton of money to be in art school. And, and the art institute is like an amazing school, by the way. So like, I'm, I'm not in any way like shooting it down. I actually think it's like one of the best things in San Francisco. It's unfortunate that it's uh, fading out now. Um, but um, there's this tension between like, you know, some people paying like, uh, I think at the time tuition was like 25,000 a year for undergrad. Um, and then you also have him doing it on the side for free. Um, I, I don't think the school loved that idea, you know, <laughs> but because uh, it's competition. But I think it's similar with like um, with the synth battle where, um, you know, maybe there's these like big bookings or these big productions that are like promoted heavily and um, maybe to some degree gated in one way or another um, that are taking place in Miami uh, at, at the venues and what the, like sort of the bigger venues and whatnot. And then you have this thing happening just like on the side, which I think is to me way more exciting than, than what the bookings are, but they're kind of like coexisting and, and maybe um, the people who go to the big thing don't, don't know that the, the small thing exists. So yeah, there's some parallels with sort of, I think experimentation in, in the art con on the visual art and contemporary art context and um, experimentation music to sort of create another context or, or like infiltrate <laughs> the music scene by creating your own context and of course there's a ton of like DIY like noise shows and, and venues so it, it's similar to that but I guess the difference is that um, there's no commerce element whatsoever in that like nobody's paying for tickets and nobody has the expectation that that this is going to turn profit um, I've actually I try to explain it to some people and quite a few people like could not comprehend that that there's no like no money to be made and unless you're William Basinski or well I mean just like with the sin battle thing like oh you're, right you're, yeah. you're not gonna like yeah uh, yeah you know what I mean like, you're not gonna sell tickets to somebody who to, to, to somebody playing who who just signed up like 15 minutes before <laughs> or maybe you can't maybe that's the next frontier I guess yeah, yeah. who knows <laughs> yeah but uh yeah i mean th this is a good point in terms of commercialization like what is commercially viable what isn't um i don't think frankie knuckles uh or juan atkinson or anyone based out of chicago or detroit or even new york thought techno or house music would be what it is now um so i'm curious like as to your thoughts about the commodification of diasporic African expressionism in a musical context and how that spectrum is so exploitative and highly commodified in today's like marketplace, like music industry. And like, I'm, I'm genuinely curious about your thoughts on this, but like, it seems like so many like underprivileged, low income individuals created these forms of culture. And now it is just a shiny object that people use to get away from their nine to five or get away from life. So there's like goods and bads to it, but from the corporate side of things, it's kind of like an extractionism. So like, but it also is a necessary evil, right? To create pockets of liberty and freedom and, and, and uh, nomadicism, right? For some of these founders but yeah what are your what are your thoughts on on that yeah so i th i think there are three sort of categories of things that come to mind one is the, um you know the music as an act of resistance and expression that later gets adopted or commodified then there's the spaces which are the clubs or the discotheques which is its own topic which i'm super passionate about and love to talk about and then the third one is just like the like commercialization of art and turning art into brands and the brands being the subject or sort of the focus of attention instead of the art which is true in, in like visual art world and it's true in the music world and it's like probably true in, in culture production that's more like um, I guess um, has a wider audience 
Um, so those are the three things to come to mind. I think we should talk about all three of them, but let's start with the one that you're asking. Um, I think that this kind of music, or electronic music, or m maybe any kind of like avant-garde music thing starts as a kind of resistance or reaction or some kind of um, wanting to have something new that, that is where um, the existing um, context is is not providing or is, is not um, doesn't create the space that, that people need to, to be themselves and therefore we have to create the space ourselves and so I'm assuming and, and I'm too young to have been around then and I've never been to Detroit um, so same yeah so assu yeah. assuming here that there was um, a desire to create a space um, perhaps for partially political reasons perhaps for just life reasons like you know people wanted to m make something because it was necessary for them to to see it um, be to, to see it exist like to say this is this is us and this is what we're doing and and this should be on uh you know at the forefront but everything else um so i'm assuming that it had sort of a, a semi political and definitely social um aspect to it which is in my opinion now it's not that it's completely gone but it's so transformed or washed over like a adopted to be something else that um, I think the majority of people don't even know that that, that original uh, thing was there and and as an example I think a ton of people in in America or like in the States think that like um, that techno or electronic music is a European thing like they they think this like something that came from like uh, Berlin or like Ibiza or something which you know I'm sure that it, a part of its history was um, you know related to these places, but that's not where it started and most people don't even know where it started um, but I think now actually there's some kind of um, in, in my research um, there was sort of the the strong years of like the the 80s in in the states where like electronic music was thriving and then there's a, a period in the 90s with like New York and electro music being very popular and also some interesting stuff going on in the late 90s and early thousands in San Francisco and New York and perhaps in Miami. I, I, sorry, my history of Miami music is not as great. Um, That's okay. We have Romulo coming by at to, to cover that topic. At four. Yeah, or you, you can ask him questions when he finishes okay. with the show. But yeah. Cool. Yeah. So uh, basically, I think that there's been periods of, of time where this has been more of a priority for um, for American society. And there's periods where it wasn't and i would say that like um the time that i was mostly in the states it was not so much of a priority which is like from like about 2004 to like for the next 10 years or so um, but now it seems like it's a priority again um and when i was in new york limelight was already closed but there were these venues um, in Williamsburg, like Glasslands and 285 Kent, um, which were sort of people could go and do their underground thing there. And now that those venues are way deeper in, um, in Brooklyn and Queens. And so I think that basically there was a period where it was not a priority. Like this was n not, not sort of a, at the forefront of people's thoughts. And now maybe it's coming back again for like third or fourth chapter but to your point about like um, origins I think that it most people have no um, trace to to the the past and or, or like the origins and then probably in terms of how bookings are done there is definitely not um, not as much credit given in terms of like booking the people who they're sort of the originators of this um, glo globally and just, yeah, um, I, I think probably this is getting into another topic, but probably um, prioritizing people who have more followers on Instagram than over uh, people who started <laughs> certain music genres. The brand. 
the uh, the image, uh, the metrics. I was actually talking to a community member not too long ago about like uh, numero filiacs and uh, just like how science is obsessed with numbers and statisticians are obsessed with numbers and social media specialists are obsessed with numbers. Like people don't think beyond or before numbers. Now numbers are kind of like an ultimatum of logic. And talking about origins, it comes from the golden Islamic age. Algebra is an Arabic word. Uh, so, you know, like, I don't know how, how much people are tapped into the origins of mathematics, but it's definitely not a Western invention at all. Very similar to techno uh, and house music. But, and even prior to that, the Chinese had their own mathematical system. Even now, uh, Chinese mathematics blows my mind <laughs> in terms of how they perceive numbers. But it's not the only thing in their culture, right? So um, I'm not sure what that human condition is to be obsessed with numbers and like uh, like overhead costs, like PL statements, like uh, like follower, like numbers seem to be this god that we serve. And obviously, this is a way more meta conversation that talks about philosophy and and even like uh, libertarianism and and. And I think uh, like Marxism, uh, and uh, there's a, there's a few different fields of of study that we can address in terms of different viewpoints uh, that we can bring to the table and, and do a comparative analysis of. But um, yeah, Austrian economics is like an interesting thing that comes to mind as we speak about this. But uh, yeah, I I think my I, I want to tie this to the two other dimensions like the the, the spaces and and like the art uh, context like for sure I am um, my two kind of observations that are quite cute or have like made a mark on me in one in each of these categories is um, I was um, once I was taking a class with the guy who founded the department at the school that I uh, went to which the department was like the, it's called new genres but it's the performance video installation contemporary conceptual art department um, his name is Howard Freed and he's a brilliant uh, artist from the uh, whose work goes back to the 60s and 70s and um, I was taking a class with him and, and I accidentally ran into him after the class at at the LACMA in LA and um, and at that point uh, this is like in 2008 or something like they were having a show about um, it's kind of like a survey of like um, fine art in America in the last like 40 years or something and each floor was a different um, decade like 70s, 80s, and 90s and so on and um, we were I don't know it's like four <laughs> floors or something but we were going up like um, kind of around the building and he was telling me what the art world was from that uh, from his perspective as an artist practicing during those years and he knew m many if not all of the artists in the show personally and so he could kind of like tell me the like what it felt like because because me going to the show as someone is much younger and that wasn't around like it's not gonna have the same like I, i'm not gonna have the same references or i'm not gonna interpret the same references as he did but he was basically saying that there was some point in I think in the 80s, maybe like late 80s or something, where the focus switched from being on the art <laughs> and you know the, the art piece and, and what 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 that is to being on the artist. Um, the artist being kind of brand, and, and he was saying that everything became a brand, the way that like Nike is a brand, and the way that Jeff Koons is a brand, and so I think that one you know, to 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 bring it a little bit to back to the numbers, I think it's, I, I don't even think of it so much as numbers, I think about this like values, what are, what are the values behind um, the, the behaviors that we're observing and, and that we're part of. And, and I would argue that, um, you know, uh, there was more, the values are more aligned with the art and then later they became more aligned with, with there being this production house that's pumping stuff. And the, the values now are like, 
what's the most powerful house or most powerful brand and the stuff is like extra it's like uh you know <laughs> to bring it to like easy or something it's like it doesn't matter what the shoes are like it's just the, the brand is like you know the, the the next drop the next number um and so that's one uh you know aspect and the which is from the the fine art perspective and then fine art turning into branding <laughs> um and then the other one from the spaces perspective i went to this um exhibition put on by the Vitra Museum uh, called Night Fever uh, Club Culture Design from the 1960s to the present and um, it was basically a survey of, of all the um, um, intent uh, documented intent of that goes into producing uh, or creating these spaces where people could um, find find themselves or experience themselves or explore um, their senses um, which predates by the way electronic music um, because the first um, club um, which is still around today is called the Piper in Rome and that club was um, I think started in the mid 60s by a couple um, architecture students who um, were not so happy with the status quo of uh, Italian architecture school at the time um, and they wanted to do something more subversive and and like uh, modular um, and maybe less uh, dictated by central powers uh, and so they found some person who gave them like a small budget and was like here you go just go for it and they took inspiration from some, uh, I think some biennales and like kind of art temporary projects that created spaces temporarily. And then they started the first club, it was called the Piper in Rome. Uh, and then they, they did more Pipers also in Italy. And uh, from there on it just kind of grew and grew and grew. Um, but um, in, in my, and then it went like from Rome to like Spain and then um, other parts of Europe, and then it went to the States with like Studio 54 and Paradise Garage and Palladium. Um, and then it kind of like came back to Europe. So I, I do have a question for you, because you're saying that this predates Mancuso and like the loft mm -hmm, yeah. and like, um, so most predates people- Predates mu electronic music. It predates, uh, so what date, what date are we talking? What year So approximately? Yeah, let, let's align these a little bit because I'm sort of making bold claims here. Uh, in a little bit. A little <laughs> bit. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, maybe I should just be more specific. Like, the you know, electronic music um, probably started in the 1910s with like the futurists and Dadaists like experimenting with avant-garde um, <laughs> means of making sound. And, and at the time it was kind of radical to to, uh, to experiment like that and, and to be chaotic. Um, and then there's been all sorts of like avant-garde composition exploration since then and through the 30s and 50s. Um, unfortunately, my, my, my education is in like fine art and visual arts. So I don't know so much about, uh, you know, what went on sound-wise uh, between um, 1910 and let's say 1960, but I my um, impression is that um, how electronic music came about um, was that after World War II, uh, as as a kind of a more mainstream thing, not not like I said, it's been like people composing avant-garde stuff since the tens, maybe before that, 1910. So that's more than a hundred years. Um, but I'm talking about when it became some kind of like movement that that found resonance with. A large enough audience to be on on the mainstream cultural maps uh so in my um it, it's also correlated with film right like electronic music and film like the first films were using very abstract forms of electronic music so scoring and and yeah yeah which the luminaire brothers out of paris uh yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of skipping over that part because I don't know so much about it. Like basically, I want to kind of bring it 
closer to to what we're talking about with like uh, the 60s and the 70s. M my impression is that basically um, after World War II, there was this kind of void of um, um, I guess it's like a very difficult period, and um, and from what I understand, in um, in Germany there was this pop music, uh, this sort of like pop rock that was being performed on stage, and and there's some people that are just like not into that because it was you know the 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 shadow of World War Two was just way too prominent um, immediately after the war or in the next like uh, 15, 20 years, and. Um, and so some people gravitated towards more um, kind of um, meditative, um, still acoustic music because they're like playing guitar and stuff. Uh, and then you had like bands like Can and Orange, um, um, Tangerine Dream, like um, who basically were like b bef before they were they were they were the tools. Um, to um, to um, express or to create music electronic, the 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 sound was already going towards electronic music, but it was performed acoustically, um, and um, so that was like on one side of like we don't want this previous stuff, which is the happy pop rock. We want to do something different, and this is right before like samplers and, and things like that came about. And then at the same time, you know these things got invented like samplers and uh, sort of sequencers that would like you'd use sequencing on, on a machine to to make an, uh, a composition arrangement um, instead of uh, you know playing it acoustically or freeform and uh, I think that combination of these things like added up to to electronic music and and in terms of like what you're talking about with like Detroit from what I understand this is like um, I don't want to get the dates too wrong, but like mid '70s, the sort of the second part of the '70s and the early '80s, and uh, um, the uh, kraut rock stuff, which is German rock. Um, kraut rock is just like a slang for German rock. Um, uh, was more mid '60s and early '70s, and so there's kind of transition and a um, coming together of the tools evolving and uh, having, you know, the samplers and electronic stuff. And then it kind of in the 70s uh, came together. And there's at, at least in, in from what I can tell, if you listen to music from the early 70s and the late 70s, you can kind of like tell this transition from um, more acoustic stuff to like then all of a sudden you have machines and it sounds like machines. Um, so that I'm, I'm saying, in, or in my mind, I'm counting that as like the birth of electronic music in the kind of like commercial social sense, not, not that there wasn't, a, you know, a bunch of avant-garde stuff like from the 1910s onward or even before that. Uh, it's just that it, that was like super niche. Um, I guess it was <laughs> kind of like uh, the synth battle, you know. Uh, <laughs> the mo the most nobody else knows that that's happening in, in uh, at that venue. So... Um, yeah, so th that's what I'm talking about. Oh, what venue, by the way? We never talked about where Synth Battle is held. It's at Gramps. It's at Gramps. Yeah. Sometimes at Shirley's, but at Gramps. Yeah. And um, so w what I mean by like it predates, uh, that clubs predate electronic music, they don't in the sense of like, you know, avant-garde composition from the 1910s onward, but they do in the sense of like music made with samplers and sequencers uh, because the f that first club, the Piper, is m made in the 60s. I can't remember if it was like 64, 68 or something, but it's definitely 60s. And then this kind of um, using samplers and sequencers to to make what we perceive now as electronic music um, is a thing of the 70s. And so there are like 10 years, um, good about 10 years, where there were discotheques or clubs that where there wasn't electronic music or DJing or whatever. Um, I would also like to talk about the lighting and the seating arrangement of yeah, like how do we? This is important to discuss. I know that you gifted me a book a while ago, yeah. and I had a visual representation of all this, and my mind was totally fucking blown. But one thing is seeing it; another thing is hearing it. And so let's talk about the lighting. Let's talk about the the seating arrangement, where the focus is at. 
maybe the multifunctionality of the space as a club and like it's different from what we think about with studio 54 or, like the loft where it's very private membership energy filter you know people are doing psychedelics running around naked kissing each other very different energy from something like what we see in rome right and spain and so let's let's talk about yeah. lighting and interior design and like yeah, yeah be, before we even get into sort of like <laughs> infrastructural medium aspect of of these spaces i want to point out maybe the most critical difference between a club and a concert um and the difference is that in clubs the um, focus is the audience those are spaces made for the audience and they're designed to be for the audience uh, well may maybe some clubs now like are a little bit different if the stage is raised or something but that's how it started that would that was the idea and i think that's the most important part like the most important distinction between a club and any other um, music venue is that clubs are about the people in the club uh, and that's even before djing and so that club the piper was basically it was modular both horizontally and vertically they had these like or maybe still have these boxes that you could move around so you could change the layout horizontally and vertically um, so and that creates um, different shapes or different environments or different versions of the environment for the audience to experience themselves um, and that that i think is like the, the biggest difference is from there on we we can talk about like lighting and and sound and all this stuff and and the lighting and the sound then become like a servant or like a facilitator of the audience experiencing themselves. So they're, they, they're like um, creating an experience for the audience. And the, you know, by contrast, a concert is kind of the opposite uh, in the sense that like you have somebody on stage that is, um, that is the focal point of the space physically and everyone's like facing them and and if you think about like a concert venue it's typically like a rectangle or a circle where there is a focal point like a perspective and everything's sort of like pointing in that direction and all the the lights and and um speakers and everything is kind of emanating uh, either pointing in that direction or emanating from that direction um and it and you can think of like a club as more like ambient architecture where, where there's like two aspects to the club one is the sound system which is kind of like a bubble where i think of sound system as like aquariums um where like you're in this like sonic um body of water i think of it as um and you 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 kind of like in some ways isolated from from ev everything else but you're sharing that experience with the people who are also in that bubble so there's that aspect to the club and then there's like the hangout areas which i think some of the best clubs in the world um they have more <laughs> space to hang out than the bubble you know like they're like the 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 spaces for the audience to experience them to experience themselves which are not the the sound system are occupy larger area than than the sound system hey really want to highlight this because what happens when someone feels drowsy or wants to lay down or feels a little sick or oozy maybe the drugs they took are bad or they're having a weird reaction to just dancing for 10 hours straight and are dehydrated um Bergheim has rooms in it for healing there's definitely some spaces. I've heard, I've heard that yeah, it's, it's, let, it's, a, it's a rumor. Let's unpack that it's, a little it's, bit. It's a yeah. rumor, but yeah. from what I've heard, uh, yeah. uh, there there are rooms where people can just like chill out and recuperate. And so the reason why I bring this up is because the functionality of a venue is beyond porta potty, <laughs> dancing on the dance floor, and you know backstage green rooms for artists it's more than all of that right so that that's why i bring it up just the multi-functionality yeah. of a specific space and like i don't know if this is true or not it's something that i've heard but like to my knowledge you know more venues should have uh more utility in their space because 
and it's not about profit or, or you know losses it's just about the well-being of their audience um for this reason so yeah that's yeah, yeah. Le let's talk both more generally and more specifically so i would say that yeah the best venues that i've been to music venues have just as much if not more usually more actually sort of what do you call the utility spaces um i you y yeah you, you you made it a little sound a little bit more hospitable and um um how do i put this um humanitarian than it than those spaces usually are right. like um i i would say that a lot of times those spaces are dark rooms where there's some kind of um couples or group sexual activities taking place uh some of them are like little cubicles where you can just lounge or do whatever you want to do um and some are just kind of common areas where people could lay down and and relax um and then there's ones that are a bit more private that are not maybe so much geared towards some kind of like private activity but they're just like you could lay down there and talk um so yeah it's it the general uh, thing is that you have more diff more and different kinds of uh, spaces which have different utilities in that context um and 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 Berkheim has a lot of uh, like the the building is amazing and um i actually m my favorite parts about that building are maybe um these areas um where you can do other things and in Berkheim they do um, they open the Halle which is the um, the half of the building that's not where Berkheim is the other half which is just as big it's actually bigger um, and they they open it for um, New Year's and uh, their birthday the birthday of the club and the birthday of the label and they always put a ton of effort and attention to make that experience special and it's usually quite different from time to time like it's com completely different layout completely different design of the the, um, the interior uh, furniture and architecture and different lighting and everything is different and um, I love that and um, unfortunately it doesn't happen so often I, I think that's because uh, the there's a residential neighborhood on the other side um, but yeah and but to your point about like <laughs> resting and hospitality um, so in in uh, in in Kiev uh, in Ukraine there's this um, club which uh, doesn't officially doesn't have a name but um, everyone there calls Kirlivska or K41 um, because that's the, uh, the address of it and um, um, in that club they've done an amazing job creating these special spaces um, and I think they've um, of course taken a lot of inspiration uh, from Burkine and just from other clubs uh, club history um, to do that uh, so they didn't necessarily invent <laughs> that uh, they just kind of took it um, to to a new level um, and there they have a ton of um, design almost like furniture designed specifically for those purposes so it's not like you have an empty room and you're gonna throw like a couple benches so we could like sit on them it's like they design a room so you could like hang out and then there's one room that has this like strange object that looks like kind of something between like a contemporary art sculpture and f metal bars to stretch and something to sit on it's really hard to describe and, and those clubs don't have you can't take pictures in them um so the, the, no chance we show that um uh, no chance we did a joe rogan thing where like jamie throw that on the screen um but um i don't even know who jamie is yeah yeah um jamie is a uh, an imaginary character um so anyway um they're they've designed spaces specifically for that and to your point about taking a a break i i have a kind of a funny story i like to tell about, tell about that i was um once the, the first time that i went clubbing in, in kiev um i went to this other their other main um constellation of clubs uh there's like one building or set of buildings um 
that's called Closer, and I was there for like, I don't know, five, six hours, and, and then I went to Kirlivska, and I was super tired, because it was like, I don't know, like 7 a.m. or something, I hadn't slept since like the, the morning, basically it was like 24 hours already, and I, and there was this giant inflatable outside, where it was there just for people to lay on, and this is during the pandemic, uh, and so I had my mask, and I was like so tired, and I was like, I'm just gonna like, take a micro nap here and I took my mask and I put it from my mouth to my, to my eyes because I want to take a nap and then somebody almost like immediately and by the way these clubs are usually very controlled environments like you you may get the sense of like anything goes there and to some degree it doesn't the sense that you're free to do whatever like kinks or sexual things you're into but but in terms of like you know what's allowed where they're very very controlled and so like immediately maybe like seconds after i lay down and put my mask on my eyes somebody comes and is like you can't sleep here it's like being at i don't know like i don't know what's the most monitored space you can think of but uh somebody comes and is immediately like you can't sleep here and they're like but do you want to sleep and i was like that's that's so important and I was like, that's kind yeah. of a strange question. Like yeah. I was now used to have, having spent some time in Berlin, I, I was now used to- um, Hospitality. Hospitality <laughs> is mm, um, not the strong suit of most uh, Berliners. Um, and so um, some, some though, I, I'm not gonna say, oh, I have great friends that are very, very good at that. Um, but so you have lived in Berlin or because you also have lived in San Francisco and, and New York but so you do have friends in, in Berlin that are hospitable and are, are nice just for people that are dispelling the grumpy old you know modular like vinyl only you know <laughs> German archetype that people have yeah. experienced uh, when they travel out there but you, you do have cool, hospitable, warm German friends in Berlin. Yeah, well, I, I would, uh, let's cover New York first and then we'll get into Berlin. So in, in New York, yeah. when I moved from San Francisco to New York, um, everyone says that New Yorkers are like really rude and grumpy and all that. Right. And I, I actually don't see it that way. I think my, my personal experience is that like, if, if you're on the street in New York City and you n need some, um, some help let's say you're lost or whatever like trying to go to the whatever you're after um like most people are not gonna stop just because you stop but if you stop them if you manage to get their attention and you ask for their help they'll actually stop and truly help you like they'll make sure that you actually like on your way to whatever you're trying to accomplish um and i don't think that's necessarily the case in like california like there's probably a lot of places in california where people will stop they will entertain you but like but they're not really trying to help you they're just like trying to be polite or something um so i think like i would say that even though people in new york look grumpy and sort of busy which they are um but uh they would they're actually kind and willing to help now let's go to germany i think that like um um you know, in in Berlin, it takes, at least in my uh, um, observation, a kind of a while to be accepted in any shape or form on on as uh, on par with with somebody who's from there. Maybe you never get accepted as somebody who's from there. Right. Yeah, um, that's always a possibility. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, I guess like going to Berlin, there's this sort of like honeymoon phase where everyone who goes to Berlin for like uh, longer than a week um, is like, oh my God, you could do anything here. Uh, you can just party all the time and everyone's, uh, may maybe it's a bit less so right now when rent's like much more than it was before. But basically everyone like the honeymoon phase is like, you're like, oh my God, I could do anything I want. There's parties all the time. Uh, I, I was told that there's, 200 clubs there this is like a few years ago like 200 venues this is like endless you know when i first uh, started um, staying there longer um i remember i was hanging out with a friend and she's like oh yeah i'm going to see this my friend djing at like 1 30 p.m on monday and i was like wow like okay so that's so the party is like like that like 
there are parties that go on you know until monday or tuesday generally i think in, in berlin tuesday is sort of the dead day um and and then from wednesday on it starts over so there's like one it, it's like you know every, other places you have like um two days of a weekend and there you have like two days where you you're not partying or you, you, there's there isn't so much parties um and then the rest is like you can be partying so when people go there they have this like honeymoon stage but then like if you stay a little bit longer you kind of maybe notice that um it yeah it's hard to acquire some kind of a um a local status but um but that's not to say it's impossible i think i myself have been lucky enough to to connect with some people who are local and established there and um both expats and um and once we're german um but it's yeah it's hard i don't think it's like super come on in like for sure one one thing about that uh, you know i really appreciate not only about berlin but certain parts of like europe is like kind of like this idea of temporary autonomous zones manifesting within artistic and like music culture and i don't think it people are bold enough here in the states to do such a thing because the u.s government will literally bomb their own citizens uh if they're that much of a threat or uh infiltrate through like intelligence operations uh before any form of culture is developed um that threatens white supremacy in any way shape or form um or the very theatrical uh political parties that are just puppeteering for uh very wealthy individuals but what i appreciate about europe is like and specifically in berlin like the like kind of anarchy ethos like integration of anarchy ethos within you know uh tazes and it's you know there there are tazes in spain there are tazes in france uh, there are tazes in in italy uh, there are some villages in italy where they don't accept euros they only have their local currency and you can only transact in those local currencies which like blew my fucking mind and this is like obviously predating crypto um but what, yeah what i appreciate about berlin is like kind of the multi-dimensionality outside of like the hedonism which is palpable right that's like yeah. a real thing and it's it's not something that shouldn't be discussed when we're talking about this legendary city but, but also kind of the deeper philosophical aspects and angles of it um which include like political implications like i think about sometimes like what if underground resistance created a fucking like taz what if derek may and like like what, <laughs> like, like what kind of you know what kind of place would would uh you know detroit be like what like what would have happened like what um if there was a political uprising or like even the black panthers or like zulu nation in new york uh like what if they actually made the fucking decision to create tazes uh, or like malcolm x and and it it just it or like martin luther king right um to protect and preserve this sacredness of culture um but yeah I, what i appreciate about you know parts of europe is that there's so many people that see the the corruption within the system and see through the theatrics of politicians and like the puppeteering of anonymous royalty um and they're like no fuck you we'll create our own system that runs parallel to this system so that like that's one thing obviously worth mentioning that's more ideological and more philosophical um like we've kind, of, we've kind of been hinting of like interdisciplinary stuff like you know contemporary art and and uh you know interior design and and uh you know architecture and, and music and how all that relates but i think also the philosophical and political implications of of places like this are really important because it's another extension of culture and music and art and so just having that intentionality of, of being a part of a larger community that has like you know privacy uh specialists and 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 uh you know people that prioritize their their data uh is is really important to mention when it comes to berlin in that vein like you know think about auto now like you 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 put me onto auto now right you showed me all these like av festivals that are so popular and on fire in in berlin and so that's something worth mentioning too in the same vein in the same context outside of like the hedonism and like the sex parties and, and all the superficial like lackluster stuff that's really temporary after a year or two it kind of gets boring right i'd assume um 
maybe not. <laughs> it depends on depends on who you are. <laughs> <laughs> but but the the point is is that there's like a deeper uh, like integrity behind everything, whether it's perceivable or not, you know. Um, and and you know having a shipping container yard where you know you have your own community private security is fucking awesome like i've seen some documentaries and uh like it just just like the consideration of like and respect of a citizen and and someone that's sovereign uh outside of like national ge geopolitical uh kind of like assertions and and indoctrinations that that captivates me and fascinates me as well outside of the music and and hedonism um, but also the, the liberation of oneself, right? So, yeah, that's just something worth mentioning, kind of like a deeper appreciation for, for this place, um, where there are these, like, safe spaces, legit safe spaces where people can, like, live in sovereignty and be themselves, so. I, I want to tie this back to values a little bit and kind of loop it through the, through the clubs that sort of as, like, discotheques and then back to, to what you're talking about, like, the political side of it. Um, I think that, you, you know, what I learned from that uh, show and, and this book that you mentioned is the catalog for, for the exhibition is that there was a point in, in, in the history of the United States where this was more of a value, like people cared and they put, and, and here it manifested as, you know, Studio 54 putting all this money, they're probably like laundering money from somewhere, but like, you know, they, they put all this energy and focus into this one thing that they valued, which was to have this party experience and they curated the people at the door. And so that was perhaps very different from like Paradise Garage where maybe it's like a completely different, well not completely, but a very different vibe. But they, those were values that mattered somehow socially to certain layers of society. And they created and enabled these spaces. And, and because people cared, like values wise it existed they found the budget or they found the space or they they found the autonomy to to do that and now here in the states at least in my observation it's you you kind of get away with it because like there's some bigger problem next door like uh for example i was uh went by a disco party here in miami like uh, last year and it was in some like alleyway uh and it was like um it's kind of like a dead end and and there are these like warehouses and, and at the end of it is like a party that seemed to me like an underage party um like underage being under 20, 21 um and uh and in as i was going to the party there were like two cop cars like pulled in front of it like between uh walking to it and where the actual party is and i was like wow that must like shut the party down because like there's the cops there and it turned out actually that the cops were there because there were people like skateboarding and like doing graffiti and the cops were actually more like there to make sure people are not painting graffiti and that you know maybe the party people at the party don't get hurt or something like they they basically they weren't trying to shut down the party um, they were most likely paid off maybe because that happens a lot in miami where you have a budget allocated just for the cops <clears throat> if you know someone that's a cop Right, but my point is that like they in Miami, I'm sure there's a lot of people getting shot and having a bunch of other things that the police can preoccupy themselves with, um, and so these setups exist because like almost like not that nobody cares, but like they're like not it's not top priority for the cops to shut down this party, you know, or they're getting paid off or whatever. It's basically, you can get away with it, um, and I think to go back to Europe, like why you could have these squats and uh, uh, temporary and permanent autonomous zones. And I want to touch a little bit on the temporary and permanence aspect because I think it's an important one. It's incredibly important, absolutely. Yeah. Um, there, I think, like in Berlin and maybe to some degree even in Prague and other parts of Europe, there is a, some enough people in society that care for these things um, that they need to be represented politically. So for example, if you're like, a, I don't know, a squatter or some kind of person that's like a more, I guess like left leftist political views, you're also somehow represented in the parliament or your views are represented by uh, whoever is in, in some of the people who are in, in power, power. And so you're 
the, the values are somehow considered, maybe not as much as you want, maybe you know, we want like more squats and they're getting fewer and fewer, but they are somehow represented or do they to, to a degree represented. And um, so it's not just because they're letting you get away with it, like you actually have some recognition and kind of support, uh, even if it's less than you would like it to be. Uh, for those kinds of activities. Uh, of course, that's looking at it a bit too romantically because simultaneously with that, like, you know, Berlin and every other major city is getting gentrified as, as fast as, as anywhere else, uh, maybe faster. Um, but um, I think the... Which may or may not be Zionist money. What do you mean by Zionist money? Uh, like, uh, okay, well, we don't have to get into it, but like the paper trail of just like how, especially in New York City, like uh, I remember we had a conversation about like certain neighborhoods, uh, like the experience being very jarring mm -hmm. and kind of like the gentrification, like the line between gentrification and like foreign control, specifically from like Israel. Uh, it's like, you can see it like Surfside, for example, or like North Miami Beach, it's very similar or even North Miami. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to get into that because that's a yeah. whole other, okay, that's a whole yeah. other thing to get into, but, but. I also don't know so much about it, so I, I'd be sort of swimming in water. Though, gotcha. So familiar with. Um, yeah, I think there are, I, I think it's a product of the world wars and um, the, um, the Berlin Wall that oh, there were all these spaces because from what I understand even between World War One and World War Two and after World War Two in Berlin there was a lot of uh, <laughs> freedom and freedom was kind of like nobody cares about this because we have bigger problems and and you're allowed to be a drunk or whatever a prostitute or whatever it is that you were doing because there's just bigger problems in society and we can't really and i assume that's actually kind of how new york was in the 70s too like manhattan or something because now you know soho is this like super polished it's like where you go to buy your alexander wang like uh, or you know whatever y3 acne uh, clothes, but at one point that was like an industrial neighborhood where it was like sketchy to hang out at, uh, certainly at night, maybe during the day too. Um, and so I'm assuming that at the time it was more like mm, bigger problems to deal with and, and we're just, you know, not so concerned with the space. And I think that like in Berlin, there are so many, or at least if, from what I understand from friends of mine that have like lived there their whole life, it used to be just like squats and squats and squats. Like Frederick's fine used to be all like uh, somebody told them it used to be one big squat basically. And that. Um, and for those that don't know, what is a squat? Like I know, I know that that's okay. like oh, like wow. There may be viewers that, or people on YouTube watching this archive video, they don't know what a squat is. But what is squatting? How many years? You know the magic seven number seven. It depends on the country, but like yeah, could could we talk about what squatting is and? Sure. Um, so a squat is a building that was n at some point not being used by whoever uh, the building's owners are. And then uh, some individual or group of individuals moved into the building and started using it in a way that they see fit often to live there, but not only to live there. They could be throwing events there, having like public... Um, food servings and like other activities that involve um, not just the residents, but, but others. Um, and in terms of the, I guess the legal status of it, I don't know, um, you know, how long it takes for something to, to be squatted. Um, but if you think of like the trajectory of, of the, that space, first you build the, the building to some specific function, then that function is not being uh, served and somebody who's not the owner sees that as an opportunity. They take over, they give it another function, and then uh, there are two kind of very different outcomes that could go from there. One is uh, you're, the people who gave it its new function get displaced because the cops came and kicked them out or, or the owner um, reclaimed it or uh, they destroyed the building or like whatever it is where that 
um, function doesn't continue, it somehow um, ends. And then the other potential outcome is that and this happens in Berlin. Um, the people who occupy the building are able to purchase the building from the owner, which is often uh, the municipality. Uh, and then they end up with some kind of special deal where, like I know of this one building, um, which is just an example, I think there's a lot of them in, in Berlin, where um, they bought the building and you can be, you can own your unit in the building, but you only own it while you live there so like you can't and you cannot sell it for profit so basically you have something that's yours but it's almost like a contract to be there uh and you're instead of paying rent you're paying like uh, sort of, uh fees maintenance fees for the building and it's kind of like a co-op so um yeah so that exists as a kind of potential transformation where from squat it, instead of like the squad being compromised or reclaimed by the original owners it transforms into um something else permanently the reason why this is so fascinating to me is because people get caught up in like leftist and rightist thought they don't like centrism is kind of like not really centrism if we think about horseshoe theory and, and where we're at in general with political ideologies and, and political thought but like no one really asks themselves like what's the blurry line between you know public housing or public real estate uh, and like public spaces and private ownership right of, of these spaces right um and that blurry line is like at least to what i've researched in the u.s it's like seven years right uh and you have to prove that you've paid for electrical or, or water so that at least in the u.s that's like the the law um it's a fully abandoned building no one is there trying to like operate right um and so when i think about this it's like there are parallel ways to acquiring real estate there's parallel ways to acquiring a location and we get caught up in like mortgage we get caught up in like inheritance we get caught up in like working nine to fives we get caught up in these systems but there are other parallel systems that we need to consider which is why like i have appreciation for for europe and we could probably go back into the temporary versus permanent autonomous zones and what an autonomous zone even is right and what sovereignty is um within like the ruling of nations um because most of the time nations don't represent us <laughs> as an individual uh they they represent a different class of people that we may not know their real identity or their real names uh that come from uh royalty M most of the time and or the railroad industry or the coal mining industry um at least here in the u.s and so yeah th that's not really a true representation of who we are as individuals so you know squatting is interesting uh you know i'd say soft anarchism is interesting like anarchy is kind of this primordial state where something else evolves from right it's like kind of this thing that turns into other things and at least from my viewpoint and we can talk about crypto, crypto anarchy in a little bit but like the reason why i appreciate not only europe uh and these parallel systems in general that are deployed throughout europe uh, is because it allows for us to break the mindset that we have of like i am american even i am european or i am middle eastern or i am asian like you just you break these continental frameworks that we've been born into and indoctrinated into and we realize oh i'm a part of a community i'm a part of a cluster i'm a part of 30 other people or 100 other people or maybe a thousand other people that i may not agree with everyone that i assimilate myself to but that is a better representation uh, of me as a citizen or as an individual a sovereign being than you know these people that have uh been paid off to say certain things uh, at certain times um and are price gouging for their opinions to be articulated in political rule so yeah i think it's really interesting and fascinating these parallel systems and maybe now we can talk a little bit more about yeah versus passes. to i guess to to define autonomy I, I think we should give a little bit of context of autonomy from what and how i guess if you think about the the trajectory of like just a, a hyper 
fast zip through like the, the history of um, of how people organize themselves. Like you have, you used to have these uh, nomadic tribes where you have a group of people that have a certain set of customs or behaviors that they um, consider normal and that they perpetuate and then they would like move around and then you we came up with this concept of territory where uh, you would say okay this territory belongs to this uh, set of people um, and that came with some uh, explicit laws because I guess like when you had a tribe there were still laws in the sense that there are things that are acceptable and not acceptable to do and they varied by tribe um, but they weren't maybe necessarily written down and as a <laughs> some long book of, of you know what's okay and what's not okay and then when you get territory you end up with the explicit writing of uh, uh, where the what the territory outline is and what things are okay and not okay to do on that territory and um, and then you often have some kind of means to protect that territory like the military industrial complex yeah um, <laughs> and 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 uh, denying well, sovereignty of Puerto well, Rico and Hawaii and well <laughs> the territory could also be your house and you could think to what degree your house is um, autonomous or private from the um, um, the surrounding territory because you could make rules in your own house like for example uh, this is a thing cheeky but like you could say oh you you can't wear shoes in my house or uh, you know right our house is like that so yeah yeah so you to some degree you define what goes into the house and you have the right to let people into the house or not um like for example that's why it, the cops need a warrant to search your house because like they can't just come in like because they want to but you still have to adhere to the to the laws of the of the territory that the house is on so for example you can't kill somebody in your house and be like well in my house that's okay you know because uh, that it, you're still complying <laughs> with the laws of of the territory that the house is on um so that's that was context for what autonomy may or may not be in these autonomous zones i think uh the the autonomy part is that in theory at least the um, the laws or the rules or the, the behaviors that uh, are okay in the autonomous territory don't need to adhere to the rules that are of the territory that the autonomous territory is inside or surrounded by uh, that's why it's autonomous um, the scale of it is is a different story because like like we said it, it could be your house it could be like a village it could be like an entire region and then the temporary te tem like if it's temporal or, or permanent is, is another aspect because you know you could say that a party is a is a very temporary autonomous zone like a party where people a hundred percent yeah yep a party let's say some warehouse party where like people are free to put whatever they want in their body uh substance or objects wise uh because that's what they like to do um is a is perhaps the or i guess like your room or something like when you're like uh, zoning out listening to music is the smallest kind of form of like you're you're allowed to do whatever you want in terms of like time and space and then from there on you expand and so let's say a festival uh like burning man or something is kind of like a temporary autonomous zone for like the week that the festival take place in the few weeks of you know uh, set up and take down but it's not fully autonomous because you still have like three different kinds of cops at least uh, on that territory but it's more autonomous than like the city next to it because like at the city next to it if you like jaywalk or something maybe you get a ticket and and in burning man there is no jaywalking like uh police or there's no police can you imagine white white rabbit police don't jaywalk no yeah but but there are <laughs> rules like oh of the, course there yeah, are rules. Yeah. yeah so um so that's like and then you have maybe a longer gathering is like more lo more towards permanent but still uh, temporary and then maybe um let's say you occupy a building like a, you squat a building for like a few years or something but then it gets reclaimed that's like um 
it's like a semi-permanent. I, I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, I didn't. We, we should uh, reference the writings of Hakim Bey on like temporary autonomous zones and what where it goes into permanent. But at least in my mind, I think it's something that lasts more than a few months is semi-permanent. Um, in the sense that it's not you don't know when it's going to get dismantled uh like you don't have a like like a festival you're like okay from here to here like from wednesday through whatever the next wednesday and then we're out um and and a, a squat is like you don't know maybe it lasts uh a few months maybe it lasts a few years maybe it's permanent because uh you managed to buy the building um and um yeah it, and in terms of the autonomy, I guess there's like different ways to approach autonomy because one is like people don't know what goes on there and that's why they don't care. And the other one is like they know what goes on there, but they have to accept it. So, for example, a squat, like for the most part, I think people know what goes on in squats and, and like in Berlin, for example, they're like, okay, the squat is there. It's this is that. And we, we have accepted, at least for the time being, that it's okay to have a squad there. And then there's the other, like the more like the crypto anarchist, like temporary autonomous zones, where maybe you don't know that there's a temporary autonomous zone and that's actually what allows you to to operate it. Um, and that then goes a little bit, I guess, into sort of the technology enabling aspect, uh, or I guess it's partially philosophical, of like, um, you know, you mentioned what is crypto anarchy. I actually think, and, and I'm I'm a big fan of. Um, uh, there's these two um, prominent uh, crypto anarchists uh, um, who have this podcast, which unfortunately I, I think might be uh, out of. Uh, might be I extinguished by now, um, but they put out maybe like 10 episodes or so, and it's called the Cypherpunk Bitstream. And they, um, the first episode is called What is Crypto Anarchy? And I really like their definition of, of crypto anarchy um, or anarchy um, in general. Like their definition is basically that anarchy is you're not forced to do anything. Um, so if you, if you take uh, government as an example, um, governments are forcing you to do something like for example you need to have a, a passport and night or an id like by law and um that's the simplest uh, i'm not going to go into too many more examples but that's the simplest um for sure use of force and they're also a monopoly because like you can't um you don't have an option of like do I, you want this kind of id do you want a miami id or a new york id no it's like where you are that there's one uh, sort of certifying agency to to certify that you're a, a resident of that area and uh and you have to have an id by that otherwise you don't count or you're somehow not not compliant and so i think that like uh anarchy would be that you have a choice whether you participate or not um and ideally you have multiple options so it's not just do I have an idea or not have an idea? It's like, can I have, an idea? like, it, I mean, I think that the ideal scenario, and I don't know if this, how realistic this is, but I think it would be optimal, um, is like if you have within certain territories, like different subscriptions, and you could kind of like subscribe or unsubscribe uh, from some kind of government if you, if you like to, um, and then they have to compete. So like, they're not, a, they're not a monopoly, and B, you're not forced to participate. Um, and then um, that satisfies sort of the, the anarchy definition that, that you're, you're not, there's no use in force um, to participate. And um, the crypto part comes, I guess, from like, um, you know, if, if you don't have the option to um, not participate uh, officially or you don't have multiple options for uh, what you're choosing to participate in um, you could create these basically parallel systems or, or circles or micro societies where officially um, maybe you're not allowed to do whatever you're doing but since nobody knows and you're protecting um, that knowledge um, through 
um, strong privacy, uh, which could be as an individual or as a group of people, uh, and to end encryption and those sorts of other ways to, to stay private, um, then you you manage to to have that even though officially you're not supposed to do anything other than what you're supposed to do. So you then you're kind of like living in parallel, um, one leg in, in the official um, thing that you're allowed to do and then one leg in the uh, thing that you want to do. Yeah, and there's a lot of implications behind that. Um, you know, we briefly talked about how there are certain villages in Italy that don't interact with the Euro. And, uh, you know, when I think about crypto anarchy, I think it's it's fascinating because maybe it's because I haven't experienced it myself. And it's kind of like this idealization of, of a system that I yearn to experience. Um, but from what I can say about volunteerism, uh, when I went to a Buddhist center quite a few years back, like the intentionality was very different. Like the camaraderie, the brotherhood, the sisterhood, um, the respect that you had for others. The intentions were kind of like a realignment and a recalibration. So I can't even imagine what it's like having your own currency, uh, like as a small community. Um, or as a city, and then that city transacts with a state through a different currency, and then that state interacts with a country through a different currency, or maybe they're interoperable, right? I guess, I guess that's a good way of kind of like uh, preserving the, the sovereignty of, of the people, right? Um, versus a bank coming in, approving, denying, if you're, you know, if you're a certain skin pigment, if you don't make enough money, you can't have one of our bank accounts. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm just I'm fascinated because like crypto doesn't matter what pigment you are, it doesn't matter like it's there. It's a tool to be used in whatever way you see fit. And specifically when it comes to autonomous operations and cash flow and, and uh, financial infrastructure. So yeah. Yeah, I think the key word or perspective that we need to look at this from is like mediation it's like to what degree am i relying on somebody else to do what i want to do um and i think that this it fundamentally um is like a function of information and information has specific subsets for example money is one uh, subset of information or communication and then assets are another subset of information. Um, and so m where I think cryptography and, um, and other uh, technologies built on it uh, uh, innovate is that you could have um, information be owned and shared only with permission and you could utilize that to um, to create systems that don't require mediation. So, for example, um, you and I could have a, an end-to-end -end encrypted conversation where only you and I know the contents of the conversation, um, unless somebody infiltrates our phones or whatever, but let's uh, you know, keep it simple for now. Um, and so we, we are allowed to... Um, to, or we're able to do this and then to apply that to assets so let's say uh, that you have uh, some kind of network like a blockchain where um, you have uh, parties that are incentivized to provide um, services to the network uh, so the network exists and that's relatively decentralized then um, you have a specific um type of information that's being exchanged and kept track of um, which can be used as a currency or, or as a way to um, have asset ownership which is uh, private um, based on on cryptography and it's not um, mediated by some nation state or a bank 
or Visa or MasterCard, uh, some other monitor network. And um, that I think is fundamental to anything else because being able to have own assets that cannot be taken away from you is, is prerequisite to doing anything else uh, autonomous because if you, let's say that you are able to take over a squat or some other piece of territory, like that piece of, of uh, territory is protected and controlled to some degree by some larger entity there, like a country or a municipality um, or a landlord or um, a bank. Um, and um, it's only if you could truly privately own something that it's yours. Because if you don't truly own it, somebody can come and take it away. So for example, you could have a house that you think is yours and then the political regime changes and now it's not yours anymore. It's Yeah, um, like what happened to my family in Cuba and in Venezuela where, you know, Che Guevara in Cuba at least and Castro decided to just reclaim all the property. Yeah. So... Yeah. Or money in your bank account, like you. Yep, they freeze you, the bank account. Yeah, you think it's your money until it's not your money because you cannot withdraw it. It could be because the bank out of business. It could be because they don't like you for some reason. Like you did something that the banks, uh, the people who are who have influence on how the bank operates, don't like. Therefore, uh, you know they decide to exclude you from that service. Or it could be that like. You're, you try to store your assets in currency, like you're just, your savings are in, in cash or some kind of derivative of currency. Um, and then the, <laughs> the cu currency collapses and all of a sudden your uh, assets are worth nothing or close to nothing because, um, because the people who are uh, sort of influencing the, the um, currency are did something that that uh, made it collapse and now your money is not your money because it's worth nothing or, I mean it's still your money but it's worth nothing um, you, you could have your money but, but it's worth nothing um, so like in Greece or in Argentina yeah, or, yeah. And, and I and I experienced that um, as, a, as a when I was growing up in Eastern Europe and um, that happened like it it devalued the currency there devalued like 2000 times or something within like a few years and um and um yeah it's game over so i think that like the the fundament where we need to start with this autonomy thing is like being able to own things that people uh, that some governing entity cannot come and take away and once we have that we could build upon that and so one example um, is you know with, with Bitcoin so you as long as you own your your private key um, nobody could take that away from you you don't even need to have it stored in any physical form you could just memorize it and then people don't even know you you own your private key because there's no physical proof I mean it's a bit risky if you lose your memory but um, um, but you could there's literally no way to prove that um, easily that you um, you own it, and um, um, and so if you have that, then you could do other things. So, for example, you could um, take a, out a loan against your your Bitcoin, and you could use that loan to rent a house, or buy a house, or rent something else, or buy something else. But the underlying, and you have to figure out how you lock up uh, the Bitcoin as collateral for your loan so that it can be taken away from you. And there, um, that we saw a few platforms that um, operate like that blow up recently. And, and you know, some people lost their uh, collateral or got liquidated or whatever. Did, um, did Nexo get, w were they a part of that or no? I think they're fine, right? They're, they're fine. They're, they're, they're yeah. good? Okay. Nexo is still there, but Celsius got wrecked and there's a few other ones. Um, so, um, 
but I think in the future we'll be able to do that in decentralized ways. There's actually a project called Sovereign, which is issuing uh, one of its uh, goals is to, uh, and Sovereign is spelled, spelled S-O-V-R-Y-N, um, where one of their goals is that you could borrow a stable coin against your Bitcoin um, just programmatically, like without any kind of uh, centralized entity in between. It's just like through code. Um, and if that stable coin is implemented in enough places, then you could use it and transact with it. And if it has some privacy features, then it will be very difficult to, to trace um, it to you. And so, but back to the, the the kind of the functional side of, of you know these micro communities or or crypto anarchy. I think that first you need the um, the ability to own an asset truly privately uh, or um, at least in a way that nobody can take it away from you um, easily. <laughs> and um, from there on, you could build additional functionality. So, for example, you could have uh, stuff related to real estate. You could have uh, currencies that you use to transact within uh, smaller economies. Um, you could have some kind of keeping track of assets like artwork or music or rights to um, to the um, distribution of, of revenue from um, from your work. Um, so once you have, I think. Um, a way to to have private asset ownership, then you could build all sorts of stuff on top of it. But if you don't have that, I think good luck, uh, you know, with everything else, including <laughs> squatting. And uh, so we are nearing the end of our conversation. Current, it has been amazing to to go this deep. Um, but I do want to have like a all encompassing kind of like final point here um and you know creating DAOs, i think is the only way to have parallel functionality and cooperation with the people in your community i i'm excited to see multiple DAOs in the next 10 or 15 years use this technology and leverage leverage this technology for sovereignty purposes um but in terms of like closing thoughts and remarks, and I'm not sure if you had any that that you that you wanted to articulate. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. No. Go ahead. I, I'll I'll say mine and then I'll let you do okay. your closing remarks. I I would just personally like for everyone to consider everything that we discussed today in terms of deconstructivism. We didn't talk about Jacques Derrida, the French logician and philosopher, which is here. Uh, he's also not there. He's he's in between. Um, so, you know, deconstruct your, your reality. We didn't talk about Duchamp. We didn't talk that about that French conceptual artist. There's so much we didn't talk about, and we've, we've just started, essentially. Uh, to be continued. To be continued. Yeah. Um, but deconstruct the system that you're inside of. Deconstruct your own thought processes. Uh, deconstruct pattern recognition, how you perceive patterns, uh, whether it's a, in a numerical context, in an artist context, in a, in a musical context, just creativity in general. And you know, question and deconstruct how money flows into your life, how it flows out of your life. Um, try to perceive your entire environment and the dimensions around you in a more uh, detailed way, rather than just take it for granted or, or just wake up in the morning and not even think about these things. So I hope that this conversation was more of an awakening for people that don't question system operations and um, art and music in a deeper way. Uh, and this is just a seed that's planted and hopefully there's uh, whether it's a DAO or whether it's a song or whether it's an art piece that blossoms from the seed that we planted uh, current in my myself during this episode uh, it blossoms into something very subjective and specialized to what you care about um, as, as a viewer and, and as a listener so that's just kind of like a final note that I wanted to write to get I'm looking forward to how you want to yeah, yeah culminate everything I would and, and we'll, we'll have to un unpack this more another time, but like, I think that one thing that that's kind of underestimated is um, the attitude of, of 
people in groups um i i find it there to be a relatively open and and kind of ex experiment open to experimentation attitude in miami um i found just as much if not um more or different um kind of attitude open to experimentation in in kiev when i spent time there last year um and i'm sure that that was a big part of um the history of berlin in the last 30 years and i'm sure it's been a big part of history of new york and other places um but it's not necessarily there in most places even in those places right now i would argue that there's less of an openness to experimentation in new york now that there was before even though i i have limited view because i wasn't around for the 70s or 60s or 80s um so i think that um the attitude of how open people are to experimentation both with technology and new ways of um experiencing and perceiving the world and acting on it is really important and i see a ton of people that are against something like they dislike nfts or they dislike this or that political thing dislike whatever wearing a mask or not wearing a mask doesn't matter like i mean it doesn't matter it matters but it's a different conversation um so people are against something but they're not necessarily for anything and if they are for something they're not doing anything to advance or usually often not doing anything to advance the thing that they're for they're just like i'm for this you know and so i think that if we're going to evolve in any shape or form in in uh any aspect of ourselves we need to adopt an attitude that's open to experimentation and and be willing to do the work to create something new um and any anything um that goes towards that or, or any effort that goes towards that for me should be respected appreciated and supported um because we're, we're just not going to evolve uh without that um and and i i guess i encourage everyone to um to consider where the attitude of openness is uh in in their life uh, either physically where they are or somewhere that they like to visit um pay attention to it and figure out how they can be part of it um so that it's not just uh oh it's great that you guys are open over here like i'm, I'm just gonna watch from the outside how you are open and you know um uh, because you know it's kind of like in the matrix if you're not <laughs> with uh, uh us you're against us in the sense that like you know being uh, complacent is you're just contributing to um the inertia of things which um uh i think this uh, civilization spearheaded by um, in the united states and europe is not necessarily on the best trajectory right now therefore um if we want to kind of if we have any chance to to direct it towards a a more optimal outcome it would come from having an open attitude and putting in the work and participating in um new models and experimentation that would get us there it's, it's certainly not going to happen by inertia because i think the inertia is headed in a pretty difficult spot okay that was uh that was a great takeaway and, and kind of closing remark to to our convo um so let's be active let's be proactive and let's not be complacent and and passive with our views let's be active and engage and be the change that we want to see thank yeah. you for having me absolutely thank you for being here it was an honor to be continued <laughs> yeah tbd <laughs> <laughs>